8.36, good morning to you. This is Breakfast with Stephen and Ellie. And it's time to go through the papers now. And joining us this morning is author Ella Whelan and former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, James Schneider. Good morning to you both. Now, do morning. we have a papers list? Uh, we do. We're going to kick off with the Sunday Times, aren't we, Ella? Yes, I picked this few scenes because I thought you'd like it. It's, oh, good. It's... Um, a new venture that's starting out um, in Marlebone with uh, the brand Lucky Saint that makes um, non-alcoholic beers oh, right. are opening non-alcoholic pubs. Oops. Well, they're still selling Guinness and things like that, a few things, but the vast majority of the stuff on offer is alcohol-free, and the right. idea behind it is to link in with the fact that apparently Generation Z and a lot of younger people are now choosing to at least part of the week or something go um, alcohol free or if they're having drinks at work they'll have alcohol free beers and it's just quite interesting because you know I, I mean on the whole I think you know going back sort of to our parents generation or grandparents generation lots of people you know pubs were populated by lots of people who didn't drink so your granny would be in there maybe she'd have a sherry or something yeah. you know yeah. or there'd be you know you'd have tea and sandwiches and things like that and it would be much more of a it, yeah. it wouldn't just be a sort of a drink yeah. Yeah. yeah and so I suppose maybe something like this is reflecting a return of that kind of thing in, in the 20 in, well you know, plus as, as, as there are more people who don't drink pubs suffer as a result so yeah reinvent reinvent yourself yes. a little bit and, and you know the the um, owner of Lucky Saint points out that obviously that what we all know is that pubs are much more than just getting drunk that there's um, you know there's there's something about having a place within a community particularly places outside of London mm. where you're sort of your pub your bingo hall, your supermarket, you know, a town yeah, might yeah. only have a few things. Having somewhere where people can come and hang out and socialise and know each other is a really positive thing. So yeah. whether it's alcohol or alcohol-free, I think this is actually quite a nice idea. And it's also renovated a pub that's been derelict in Marlebone for quite some time. Well, there you go. Mm. What's, what's not to love about that? No, that sounds, I mean, all, all round sounds quite nice. I, I mean, I'd probably prefer a more traditional boozer, but, I, mm. you know, it, I, that's what people want. It sounds really nice, and I agree that the a, the, a pub is a social institution. It's not just a place where people get drunk and, wait, you know, there are more ways that people can do that, especially when we've had so many pubs closing over the last 15, 20 yeah. years or oh. so, then I, it sounds good. Yeah, yeah. There's, a sp there's a focus now on wellness and lots of people are, are looking at going sober or there's that term, isn't it, sober curious, people who just want Sorry. to not have a drink just a few days a week. Well, but, just drink um, a bit less. There, it is, <laughs> right at the end of the story, it does point out that there have been a few places that have tried to open completely alcohol-free mm. places. Yeah. and have failed so there was a bar uh, called So Bar in the oh, pool yeah. that shut down and had to reopen with a licence called Redemption so oh, right. oh, <laughs> we like our drink Fair enough. Well, we well mixing it up I think is a good thing that yeah. it covers everybody then. and offering something for everyone exactly yeah. uh, James let's look at the time shall we and you've got a story about yeah. volunteers who are, who are saving Amazon no, they're not saving Amazon. They're, they're, they've defeated Amazon. Oh, they've Lo oh. defeated local, Amazon. local heroes who shut door on Amazon. It's another um, good news uh, story, I think. It's some uh, locals in, in West Yorkshire in, in uh, a village called Skulls who there was going to be a massive site, a big Amazon uh, warehouse was going to be built on um, some greenfield sites next to where they live, and they got together a local campaign. And by the narrowest of votes, apparently four votes to three in the Kirklees Borough Council Strategic Planning Committee, they managed to, they managed to defeat, uh, defeat Amazon, yeah. which is... Which is pretty amazing, you know, one of the one of the world's biggest um, companies on an enormous expansion, and they said that they that they didn't want to have it. They, now they've got a few reasons why they didn't want it. So they're the ones you might expect, which are like environmental, local yeah, community. Yeah. But actually, this greenfield site was rezoned in 20, 2019 for um, uh, for new industry and employment, and they all actually support that. But it's just they want they say, well, we were promised that we were going to get, you know higher end manufacturing good jobs that they want their kids and grandkids to uh -huh. have and yeah. they say these you know these are not that's not the jobs that they want their kids to have um, and so they've they, they fought back and they won now Amazon say they're not going to stop they're still trying to open up here um, but you know for now they've won yeah, local, well, pe local know, people standing up for themselves. It's a, uh, it's, it's a lovely story. Well, it's local democracy in action, isn't it? In, the, in that sense, you mm -hmm. can't argue with that. No. Um, the Observer uh, 
Ella, what are they saying about the SNP? Yeah, well, just because we're going to find out the new leader tomorrow, oh. um, I thought I'd pick up on this, which is that the Scottish Greens have have given their two pennies worth and said that if, basically have intimated quite strongly, that if Kate Forbes um, is declared the new leader, then they will not remain in partnership with the SNP, specifically because of her views and particularly her, you know, her her position on not wanting to continue Nicola Sturgeon's and now Hamza Youssef's campaign around self-ID and um, reforms for uh, transgender rights. And it's just quite interesting because, you know, the it tells you something about the state of the SNP that so much of the discussion is not about independence, but it's particularly yeah. about um, views around, you know, what, what the Greens have called progressive views, um, saying that it's, you know, one of the most toxic parliaments I've ever been in, um, says the Scottish Green leader. And it's, you know, I think a lot of people probably are asking in Scotland are asking more fundamental questions about, you know, the state of the Scottish NHS, the state of um, education in the NHS, so much of the failings of the SNP in terms of policy making over the years. Very little on that. And it's now a row about whether or not um, Hamza Yusuf is right to continue pushing for, you know, trans women to be allowed into women's prisons I think it's probably quite depressing and I don't know that the Scottish Greens coming out and making these statements is going to favour many um, Scots uh, in line with sort of the SNP I think it's really a party in free fall at the moment mm. Mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what happens you tomorrow. find this don't you with leadership elections I mean the longer they go on for it just it just turns toxic mm. I mean, and this has been we're seeing again the SNP it's been particularly, particularly adversarial and I mean uh, uh, the observers reporting that Hamza Yusuf has just slightly has the edge for tomorrow oh, really? and I probably that's what most people expect mm -hmm. um, but it is important to note that Kate Forbes is quite popular with people she's been very she's been strong up until now and aside with aside from her um, you know religious views which you know i completely disagree with in terms of abortion and things like that she has um really stuck the boot into nicola sturgeon's um you know failures in relation to you know, promises on um climate change you know being unrealistic and ruining people's living standards and all that kind of thing saying that we can't transition away from oil and gas so quickly which all resonates with people well, yeah, obviously not. It won't go down well with the Green Party, no, obviously. No. Obviously. What do, you, what do you make of it all? I think, I mean, the SNP is having a kind of identity crisis because it has been this unbelievably successful catch-all party. But because there is no path to independence, because the British state isn't going to allow it, what would have happened after they got independence, which is basically the party begin to come apart because, you know, this Kate Forbes kind of codes centre-right, she's more free market economically, uh, Hamza Yusuf codes more sort of centrist or, or centre-left. That's what, you know, that's actually what this, this divide is. And it's a party that has held together views that are diverse and now without a really powerful figure like you know you can agree or disagree with um, Nicola Sturgeon I disagree with her on, on loads of things and same thing Alex Salmond these were very big very effective politicians who could control that coalition and you know whoever wins whether it's Yusuf or, or Forbes it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to do that. Mm. Okay we've got, we've got time for one more story um, so let's have a look at um, let's have a look. I'm trying to choose which one we should go with here. Which one? Uh, the Telegraph. Let's go with those um, Ofsted. They flagged welfare concerns for Ruth Perry. It's a very sad story, isn't it? The head teacher who, who took her own life. Yeah, in it's section. yeah, it's a very sad story. Yeah, about a, a head teacher whose school was downgraded from Ofsted from outstanding, I think, to inadequate, and subsequently took her life. And th there's, I mean, it's it's hard to know exactly you know, who has done what and whether the right things were done. But I think what it does show is about the testing regime that we have in schools and the stress that that is putting on. Not just um, teachers who, you know, perhaps you, do, you don't want people to be stressed to the point at which they take their own lives. Of course, that's horrendous. But, you know, you want your school to feel some pressure to improve. But we've got, you know, there are reports of children vomiting through stress from, from endless testing and, and so on. And I think this could start a conversation about how do you have uh, testing which is less stressful and all year round. So mm. the results that, uh, that kids are, are doing from their homework in ordinary times, that goes together to what, uh, how the school is seen which I think might be might lead to less stress, which you know, we don't know. We can't say what caused this person's no, no. death. No, 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 we can't, no. No.
I don't know, I'm in favour of testing um, kids, and I think a lot of, you know, I seem to remember sticking fingers on the back of my neck to try and get out of a few exams in my time. But the thing about Ofsted is I used to work, years ago, I used to work at a school, and, you know, the, the, the nights before an Ofsted um, an, uh, inspection was announced, we'd spend ages sort of printing out the right policies, getting them in the right folders, all this such waste of time, like nonsense. And one of the really horrible things about this particular school was that it was, the, if you read the report, the children were really happy actually the education levels were great she was doing a really good in terms of teaching the kids the failures were in you know significant things like um, safeguarding and, and record keeping but you know you can imagine what that might actually look like in terms of not having your files in order and I think most parents would probably prioritize whether the kids were happy and well taught mm. and so I think Ofsted is often just such a it's such a blunt tool that doesn't actually tell you a huge amount about what a school really is like yeah Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I just I, what worries me slightly is that it has turned into this very anti Ofsted thing, as if Ofsted has caused this tragedy. Mm. Yeah, which which and the pa the family them to be fair, the family themselves did. Well, I'm glad that they did come out and say. You know, suicide is a very complicated thing, and obviously we know that any of the inspectors meant well. So it, it yeah. wasn't a kind of you know you caused our daughter to die sort of thing. Uh, yeah, it's important to note because I think so often suicide gets talked about as a sort of it, it almost gets weaponized, and actually yeah. everybody knows that mental health is an incredibly complicated yeah. thing and complex. And that's the point that you were making yesterday. Uh, yeah, it? yeah, it was interesting. We had a, a viewer yesterday who's. Uh, uh, who, I think it was it was his wife and two children have all worked in mental health and, were, and all said it's you know it, it is such a complex issue you can't just simplify it you can't make it that black and white can we just have a quick look at Shirley Ballas yeah. yes not Bassy no. um, see well I made the mistake as well so you know um, being the kind of judge that she is on Strictly and having the views that she, you know she's very popular and very experienced she's saying that she has had a huge amount of abuse online for her criticism so she said that she always gets to be honest Shirley I mean you know on, on Twitter you should expect some of this kind of nonsense that happens but she says that people say she's ageist she's sexist because of the people that she picks and she's saying that it's you know it's a hit me very hard and that I might have to quit my job um, but it strikes me that someone who is a judge and particularly in the competitive world of, of that kind of yeah. ballroom dancing I mean she must be used to a huge, to a fair amount of kind of criticism. It's not exactly a friendly world to exist in, is I'll it? I tell you what, I have a, and it sounds awful. I don't have a lot of sympathy with her. Me neither. In, in the sense that if she, well, I'm going to have to quit my job because of the criticism. Or surely you could delete Twitter. Yeah. Which then you could keep working. Yeah. Just don't look at her. I mean, I, you know, I very rarely look, and I'm sorry if you get in touch all the time. I very rarely look at social media now. My other half runs my social media because I've got I, social media manager. I've got a social media manager. Lucky be, you. Be, be, but, but because it's, it, it's almost like a bloody full time job at the minute. Um, it's hard work, and sometimes people are just so nasty. Turn off your notifications. Don't, oh, yeah. don't Google your own name and, and just get the notification for people that, yeah. that, that, um, that, that follow, and then she won't be seeing quite so much of this stuff. And, or, and perhaps the show should give her a digest of you know feedback and so on and edit out stuff that's horrible and, and, um, and cruel and, and, and mean if any of the criticisms are legitimate. I mean, I, I yeah, valid criticisms are fine. Yeah, well, I mean, and you want that. And you, yeah, do, yeah. you do want, you do want um, uh, viewers of any programme to be able to have some input into, into how it's run. It's just if it's abusive, then, you know, that the people should be sh shielded from that. And you can shield yourself by... Not, not, <laughs> not, not opening that door. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very valid point. Um, James, Ella, it's been really good to see you both this morning. Thank, Thank you very much. much indeed.